On this subject of the independence of arts from either uh, funding from agencies or political interference, um, we just had a thing here in, in, uh, in Toronto where a board, in this case, in terms of the factory theater, made a move on an artistic director, Ken Gass, who was returning good seasons, returning uh, good balance sheets, uh, had no problems any other way, except there was a disagreement over a, a redevelopment idea. And the board booted a successful artistic director. So that, for me, is in the middle of that subject of how, how do we maintain independence of the arts and yet have boards that have power, have uh, federal and provincial funding that have power, and have politicians that have power. How are we doing on that respect, is my well, question. It's, it's so difficult, uh, because there's Ken, you know, turn out his guts to keep a company going and, and selling it and doing it. And can he foresee that there's going to be such a difference of opinion that he can't get to individual members of the board to get them on side? I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, in my, I think my second year at the Canada Council, I think it was in my second year, I get a call from somebody in Shaw saying, they're going to fire Chris Newton. The Shaw Festival. Shaw Festival. I said, what? He said, yeah, he's they're, they're telling them that uh, they're not going to pick up his contract after this the third year. I said, who's telling them? He said, well, there's some people on the executive. I said, well, that <laughs> they've got their, their submission in for the third year and the stability and all. You know, this is kind of crazy. Why? Don't know. So I, I went to Tim Porteous and I said, what do we do uh, about this? This doesn't seem to be any reason. He said, well, talk to some of the board members who are not on the executive committee. So I found a couple of them and called. And they didn't know. They didn't know. And I said, and they said, well, what would happen to us in terms of the Canada Council if this were to happen? And I said, I can't tell you what would happen, but I can tell you this. I don't think it would be positive. Oh. Next thing we knew, some people were talking. And some people talked to people in the executive. Over a period, I think it was about two months or so, Chris was okay. Now, was that interference on the part of the council? What do you think? I think it would have been very sad if an artistic director had been dismissed out of hand like that. We're all part of circles that intersect at various points, sometimes accidentally, sometimes by design. And how we behave at those intersections, in a sense, defines who we are. And if one is seeing that something that is not appropriate is happening, then I think one has to take a stand. And if one has the possibility of affecting it, then I think you do. All right, very good. Let's go to Ken Gas Factory Theatre example then. So there you have a board and I mean, we can talk about what the board might have done and what the councils might have done, Toronto Arts Council, uh, the Ontario Arts Council, Canada Council. We might talk about that, but if we put the dilemma in a slightly wider uh, idea, mm -hmm. that if you have a non-profit theatre which owns real estate, and if you have a board which in theory has full mandate and full control of the theater. If the board decides that, in this case, factory, I'm not saying this is what they do, but it could be true for Tarragon, it could be true for Buddies. That if the board of Tarragon said, there's more money in the real estate that we own here in Toronto, why don't we actually sell it, take our $20 million, go away, and actually build an endowment fund, and we'll build a theater in a Tarragon theater in the bottom of a condo. What's to stop a board doing that? If the artistic director Richard Rose says no, the arts community says no, what's to stop a board doing that to a nonprofit theater? Well, 
the simple fact is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate authority is the board. You can't get away from that. So, given the gang of four, yep. uh, and given should there be a direction to the Arts Council saying you actually do have more responsibility, that if you have a rogue board, who is to stop them? And who owns, because the bottom question, Walter, is who owns the theatre? The board doesn't own the theatre, and yet they have the decisions over it. The theatre has been created through grants, through audiences, through sweat equity, through low wages from all the artists. So at the bottom of this is, should we not redefine, we'd redefine who, in way, in philosophical terms, owns a theatre, and how would that reflect back up to powers of the board, overall power of the board, and what the councils have to say? What uh, what, uh, what I would like to see in that kind of a situation is with the conflicting visions of the factory, I would want to inquire. If I were the Ontario Arts Council or the Canada Council, I would want to inquire as to why these visions are in conflict, who if anyone is profiting from one decision as opposed to another. If there is a conflict there, if, I mean, let's say for example, you were the chairman of the board there and you were a real estate developer and you had an interest, a personal interest in this, then hey, this is clouding something here and somebody has to call it here and speak to it. Who calls it? Well, I think of the funding agencies, absolutely. If there is that kind of personal enrichment. So you're saying, you're suggesting that, say in the factory can gas situation, that there should be a layer put in the arts grants to the theater saying, it is, uh, it, we take it as our responsibility if there is an intractable disagreement between the, the board and the artistic management, that we, the Arts Council don't have a right to solve it, but at least we have a right to inquire. And to facilitate. And to facilitate. Yes, absolutely. And that's part of our job as an Arts Council. Absolutely. In, yeah, okay. You know, I mean, I was, I was offered, uh, talk about mentors, Maver Moore, God bless him, he, he caused me more trouble in my life. Uh, they came after me twice to go to the Canada Council. When I announced in, uh, in 77, I think it was, that this was my last season at TMB, it was my 10th season, and I was, uh, going to be, and I was going to go back to Newfoundland and write. And Alden and I were working on stuff, and I got a call from Maver. Uh, he said, "You know, David Peacock's retiring. You should come." I said, no, <laughs> no, that's not for me. And then a little while later, I got another call from him. He said, "Come up and just talk to us." So I went up to Ottawa and I talked to him. I said, "Look, I'm not bilingual. We'll put you in immersion." <laughs> I said, I, "I would only commit for two years." Okay. And so anyway, he, he, he got me there, and. I was staggered at how good the staff people that I worked with were. And they were all theater people. They were all Linda Gaborio, you know, translations, uh, Anna Stratton, pr producer, you know, Rick Roberts. Uh, all of these people were just brilliant, committed people. And we all felt that. Generally, these positions should be held by active professionals who came for a limited period of time, maybe two, three, four years at the most, and then went back into the, into the business. And of that crew, all of us did. All of us did. And I think that we understood how, how theatres worked.